I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector News Podcast, and we are on location at the Energy Transition Summit in Washington, D.C., and I have sitting across from me, old friend and the president of the Uranium Producers Association, Scott Melby. It's good to see you in person. Uh, hi, Michael. And it's good to be in, in D.C., which is familiar territory for me. So, uh, Yeah, definitely. You've uh, <laughs> spent a fair amount of time. It's my first time here, but, uh, you know, I should have hired you as a tour guide yesterday. Make sure you make, make it to the Smithsonian, but uh, you could take about five days and not get through it all. Uh, yeah, no, no doubt. I was, uh, I was watching. It was like building after building after building. Smithsonian, Smithsonian, <laughs> Smithsonian. Um, this is a good uh, conference for you to be at. Um, uranium has got to be at the forefront of the energy transition. Is uh, as we're moving forward in past conversations, we've talked about uh, the small modular reactors. We've talked about the uh, the press points and. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today is what kind of progress has been made in the last little while. Um, we've determined that the issue isn't uh, getting the actual uranium. We have lots of it in North America. It's about processing it. And we also have the threat of uh, banning the Russian uh, processed uranium uh, on the horizon. So um, how's government moving? Are they uh, moving quickly at, uh, at resolving this issue? Yeah, well, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, there, there can't be an energy transition without nuclear power. And I think uh, recent years, we've begun to see that an over-reliance on renewables, which uh, are fine, but they, you know, providing power 30% of the time can't be 100% of our energy. So uh, really, the acceptance of nuclear power over the last five years or so has just been uh, uh, phenomenal. And it's bipartisan. We see re Republicans and Democrats uh, embracing nuclear power in a way that that I haven't seen in my 40 years uh, in in the nuclear energy industry. Um, back here in DC, it, it, it's one of the only things that they agree on. Um, very uh, little is uh, passed in terms of legislation these days, but we have seen numerous bills passed that have uh, tried to shorten the regulatory time period for new reactors, uh, revitalize the uh, uh, fuel cycle in, in the United States and give a boost to the existing fleet through production tax credits on nuclear power. So uh, we we don't have uh, political headwinds that 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 have been sort of typical. I think the uh, the angst of the left is now being turned on fossil fuels, whether it's natural gas or coal. But uh, uh, but we have an incredible opportunity. Uh, at the end of the la uh, last session last year, uh, they passed the NDAA, the uh, uh, Defense Authorization Act, which had 2.9 billion, uh, 2.7 billion. I'm sorry, uh, authorized for revitalization of the nuclear fuel cycle. That amount was authorized, was actually appropriated through a bill that passed earlier this year. But in that bill, there was a stipulation that the funds would not be released until there is a Russian uranium ban either legislatively or administratively. And the reason for that being that there's a number of folks in Congress that didn't want to ban Russian uranium until we had the domestic fuel cycle ramping back up to replace them, or vice versa, didn't want to give the money uh, and then have Russian uranium undercut the market down the line. So we're just, uh, if not for one Senator, Ted Cruz, that's put a hold on that ban, completely unrelated to our issues, but a, a separate semiconductor chip issue that he's lobbying for. Um, he will either lift that ban, will attach that language to other must-pass legislation, or DOE uh, is just going to move ahead and 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 ban uranium along the lines of, of the legislation. We're actually meeting in Washington this week with the Department of Energy and Nuclear Energy Institute to put in place the administrative measures of how that ban would would work. So uh, it's coming, um, and I'm confident that the combination of the funding, the ban, and just the strength of nuclear power, we will have a revitalized nuclear fuel cycle, uranium conversion enrichment in the U.S., but these are important pieces that have to uh, come in place to give folks the comfort to invest the billion, billions of dollars needed uh, to get our our, our uh, fuel cycle back uh, up to where it was prior to the breakup of the Soviet Union and can be again. Okay. Now, 
there was a bit of a, a hiccup in the uh, small modular reactor world last year when the uh, Wyoming reactors had to be uh, um, put off a little bit because we didn't have the fuel mm-hmm. for them. Uh, is that issue being moved forward to being resolved? And it, It's part of it. That's the, the HALU, the high assay, low enriched uranium issue that some of the advanced and small modular reactors run on this higher octane, 20% enriched uranium, uh, which is currently only produced by the Russians and Chinese. Uh, but again, there's not a, a congressman in the, either on the House and Senate side that doesn't know what HALU is today, which is a very good sign. You don't have to explain it to them. Everyone sees these SMRs as the future, and uh, no one wants to see programs like Terra Powers in Wyoming set back for lack of fuel. So uh, that that particular aspect of the domestic fuel cycle is getting a lot of attention, and you know we just we need to move forward and, and execute. And that's probably the biggest uh, challenge is we got to get DOE to get off the uh, mark and and actually execute these programs. They're getting funding. Get the ban, move forward, and then uh, we, you know, we can't afford to have delays of small modular reactors because the fuel's not ready. No. Now, just so people understand, what are we actually talking about as far as processing goes? How many processing plants are needed? How much uranium needs to be processed in a year? What's the current capacity versus what's going to be needed in the future? Yeah. So um, I think. The the idea is that we want to incentivize at least two um, uh, domestic enrichment facilities. So whether that's Urenco or Centris or GLE or, or any number of kind of smaller startups, we want to incentivize that kind of capacity. Urenco in New Mexico is already expanding. So we know um, uh, that it can happen if there's the market certainty and the, and the strong policy. On the conversion side, the, the the world probably needs another good sized conversion facility. Um, uh, I'd like to see that in in North America. And then on the uranium side, I mean, let's not forget that we went from an oversupplied situation in uranium, uh, even though we were in a deficit between production and consumption globally, we had inventories that was fil- that were filling the gap. Those inventories are now gone and helped by Sprott Physical Uranium Trust and others. We need eight to 10 new uranium mines coming online between now and 2030. Good news is there are five U.S. producers that have either restarted or starting up operations like UEC is in in, uh, August in Wyoming and second half of next year in Texas. Uh, We have uh, Boss that's restarted uh, mine in Australia and Paladin in Namibia. We probably need five or six more. And some of these are going to have to come from countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, or Kazakhstan that present their own unique geopolitical challenges. So we shouldn't just think that it's just the processing. That's important, and that is a bottleneck. We need to have the raw material uh, in the form of new mines. But again, I'm I'm confident that with a combination of policy and, and market forces, we're going to get there, but it, may, it won't be quick. And that's where I think investors see a squeeze in uranium prices continuing and not a short, you know, uh, not to be resolved in months, but probably years. So I think we could have a very strong secular bull market in uranium that uh, lasts uh, a lot more legs under it than, say, the last uh, bull market that peaked and came back down rather quickly. Yeah, I was going to uh, to mention uh, uh, the uranium spot price. Although in, in the uranium market, spot price isn't actually a fair measure because most of the uranium is sold on on long-term contracts but uh the spot price uh peaked out at about 108 dollars and it's uh has slowly come off that i guess that's that's normal market behavior yeah um are we reaching the point where the supply and demand matrixes are going to uh start to push that price back up again yeah i mean we went from 50 dollars a pound in the spot market to 106 um, in less than 18 months, uh, it's now kind of fallen back to the high $80 per pound, $88 a pound today. That's normal. It's more of a, a kind of a consolidation and forming a new base at these levels. And there's been plenty of support at, at this, but it's kind of spooked the uranium equities. Uh, folks said, well, is this like lithium? We saw lithium go so high and then come back. And so I think a lot of generalist investors may have sold 
captured very big profits uh, on the trade. Uh, but I think what you're seeing now is is a base forming for the next leg up. So I would expect uranium prices and the equities to have quite a rally here uh, because, frankly, the, the demand is there. The pounds aren't. Uh, and it's really going to squeeze that spot market. And, you know, companies like UEC are unique. Um, my company is unhedged, so we love the spot market. And uh, it's not our job to hedge away utilities upside risk. It's to get investors the highest price we possibly can for our production. So we're quite happy uh, to be uncommitted um, and have all of our production available to sell into the, the market squeeze that we see uh, underway. That's uh, that's good. So um, meetings, talking about processing, talking about mining. There's very there's still a bright future in uranium going forward, and with all of this, the future demand. I keep reading that that's not even taking into account the advent of the uh, the small modular reactor. Yeah, it's really it's quite amazing. Um, you know, I'm part of the working group in the World Nuclear Association, and we put out the latest report in September of last year, which had data uh, on demand that was kind of finalized at the beginning of last year. Our base case is now gravitating towards the high case in that study. And uh, that's even before you layer on uh, the big wave of small modular reactors. The first of a kind units are being built between now and 2030. Those are the demonstration projects. But the big, big wave comes in 2030 uh, onwards where hundreds of these plants are going to be ordered, built. Uh, they'll be um, serving as power for data centers to, to drive AI, electricity demand, uh, hydrogen production, desalination, uh, industrial uses for heat and electricity at petrochemical facilities, mine, uh, remote mining uh, operations, and even island nations. So, um yeah, but uh, you think we have a gap in uranium supply and demand now when you get to 2030 onward, we don't need eight to 10 new mines. We need significant big investments in, in uranium, uh, which uh, you know favors companies that are, are positioned like UEC or my other company, Uranium Royalty Corp, which is a capital provider to that next generation of mines. And uh, we have a big, uh, very healthy pipeline of new projects to to fund in Australia, Africa, US, and Canada. So it's really, truly boom times in the uranium space. Yeah, I'm uh, reminded yeah. of that old 80s uh, song, uh, The Future's So Bright, I Gotta Wear Shades. I love that song. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> I think that's the only one I ever heard about, uh, about a nuclear scientist. New, yeah, studying nuclear science. My future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure having you on again, and uh, we'll... After uh, things progress through the summer, we'll have you back on again in the fall, and uh, hopefully we'll hear some more good news about the marketplace. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Scott. The Prospector News Podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.